Hello, my name is Sean Teague and I'm a radiologist from Indiana University School of Medicine. And I wanted to discuss with you for a few minutes the appropriate indications for cardiac CT. The current guidelines that I'm going to be discussing were developed in 2010 by a combination of cardiology and radiology organizations that came together to put together the appropriate use criteria for cardiac CT. One of the key things that you're going to need to know in order to determine the appropriate indication for cardiac CT is what is the pretest probability of coronary artery disease in a patient. So there are three main categories, low, intermediate, and high. And as you can see, the majority of patients are probably going to fall into the intermediate category with a pretest probability of 10 to 90 percent. So let's take an example. Let's say that we have a 40 to 49 year old male who has atypical probable anginal chest pain. That patient that you can see here will fall into the intermediate category. If the patient was asymptomatic, they would actually fall into the low pretest probability category, whereas if they had the typical angina pectoris type chest pain, they would fall into the high risk category. Here are the six main categories of indications for cardiac CT, and we are going to go into each one of these in detail. So let's start with the patient who has chronic symptomatic chest pain, no known coronary artery disease. If the patient has an interpretable ECG and can exercise, the patient must be in the intermediate risk category in order to qualify for a cardiac CT. However, as soon as the ECG becomes uninterpretable, or the patient is unable to exercise, a low risk patient would also qualify. So now let's look at the patient who is acutely symptomatic with chest pain. So this is the patient that you're worried is coming in for an acute MI. Basically, as long as the ECG or the biomarkers, the troponin, are not positive, if the patient is in the low or intermediate risk category, they would qualify for a cardiac CT. So, if the ECG and biomarkers are normal, uninterpretable or non-diagnostic, or equivocal, a low or intermediate risk patient would qualify. What about the asymptomatic patient? Well, calcium scoring is always appropriate, and we're doing a fair number of these at our institution. But with respect to coronary CTA, the patient either has to be low overall global risk with a family history of premature coronary artery disease, or they must be at intermediate global risk. So how do we determine the global risk category? We look at the ATP3 guidelines. I do want to bring up one bit of a caveat here in the fact that I have a little bit of concern about doing coronary CTA in a patient who is asymptomatic, because what are you going to do to manage these patients? If you find a significant stenosis, are you going to send them to cath to get a stent? Stents have never been shown to improve mortality. They've only been shown to improve morbidity, which is basically done for pain relief. But these patients are asymptomatic. They don't have chest pain. Diabetic patients are a little bit of a different story because they can have silent ischemia. So I just caution you a little bit about doing coronary CTA in an asymptomatic patient and thinking about what the further management will be. So let's go back and talk a little bit about the ATP3 guidelines. Patients can be qualified into the high, intermediate, or low risk category. And you can see associated with this, there is a risk over the next 10 years of having a major event of myocardial infarction or death associated with each of these categories. If you have one of the four conditions listed under the high risk, you automatically qualify as a high risk patient. Otherwise, you would need to be stratified into high, intermediate, or low risk. And the way that you do that is with the ATP3 risk calculator. You can find these online. This is one from the NIH website where you fill in the patient's age, gender, cholesterol, whether they're a smoker, what their systolic blood pressure is, and if they're on any medications for blood pressure. And then based on this, it will give you which of the three risk categories the patient falls in. Patients who have new onset congestive heart failure with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Basically, in this situation, you're trying to determine if coronary artery disease is the cause of the congestive heart failure. Both the low and intermediate risk patients qualify under this scenario.
pre-op for non-coronary cardiac surgery. Basically, you're performing coronary artery evaluation prior to surgery, and the patients have to be in the intermediate risk category. Here's an example of a case that we did at our institution. This was a patient who was going to have a thoraco-abdominal aneurysm repair, so we were evaluating the coronary arteries prior to that. The very interesting thing in this case is we found, incidentally, a single coronary artery ostium. So you can see here there's only one ostium arising from the aorta. It's arising from the right coronary cusp, and it's supplying the right coronary artery as well as coming across and supplying the LAD and the circumflex coronary artery as well. So you can see it's just a single coronary artery ostium. So in the pre-op non-coronary cardiac surgery patient, the patient must be intermediate perioperative risk. This means they cannot have any of the active cardiac conditions listed on the left, which include unstable angina, decompensated heart failure, significant arrhythmias, or severe valvular disease, and they must have one or more of the clinical risk factors listed on the right, such as ischemic heart disease, compensated or prior heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, or renal insufficiency. There are also patients who have had prior testing. Basically, if they've had normal testing with new or worsening symptoms, if they have discordant tests, such as a discordant exercise treadmill test and a nuclear medicine stress test, or if they have equivocal stress imaging, they would qualify for a cardiac CT. Patients who have had prior coronary artery bypass grafts, we can evaluate the graft patency in symptomatic patients. Now the one interesting caveat here is considering doing evaluation of bypass grafts immediately after surgery in the hospital setting prior to the patient being discharged. The idea behind this is that if one of the grafts goes down in the immediate post-op period, but the patient is asymptomatic, if the patient returns and that graft is similar in appearance with no other grafts down, it's unlikely that is the cause of the patient's chest pain. Had we not performed imaging in the immediate post-op period, we would not know whether the graft that is currently down is the cause of the patient's chest pain or not. So consider doing evaluation of the bypass grafts in the immediate post-op period prior to discharge of the patient because there may be grafts that go down in the immediate post-op period due to competitive flow from the native coronary artery. You can also localize grafts prior to redo of coronary artery by bypass grafts. Basically, the main thing that we're looking for here is to make sure that the bypass graft is not adherent immediately behind the sternum. Primarily, we're talking about the left internal mammary artery in this situation. If it is immediately behind, they'll do an incision and go in to redo the bypass grafts just off midline to the side of the sternum rather than going directly through the sternum. As far as stent evaluation, the only thing that's appropriate according to these guidelines is a prior left main stent that's greater than three millimeters in size and in an asymptomatic patient. Adult congenital heart disease, many patients are going to get MRIs and I think that's very appropriate, but there are certain situations where you may want to perform a cardiac CT. For example, there may be patients who have contraindications to MRI and therefore you can look for a cardiac CT to answer the question. The other thing is, is if you're really concerned about the coronary artery anatomy, then cardiac CT is quite appropriate. This is a patient with extensive uh, congenital heart disease. You can see the patient actually has a conduit which arises from the right ventricle. And as you follow that up here, you can see that that actually comes up an anastomosis with the right pulmonary artery. So this is an RV to PA conduit. You can see there's a ring here. This is from the artificial valve that's actually in the conduit to the pulmonary artery. You also may notice a device here. This is a septal occluder within a high VSD and the aorta you can see kind of overrides. So this is a variant of a tetralogy of Fallot. You'll notice that also there's a large calcification here. If you follow that down, that's actually the pulmonary artery, which basically is completely atretic, is non-existent from this point to the pulmonary arteries here at this level. The final thing you'll notice is the coronary arteries. Here's the right coronary artery. It comes up 
and comes around and actually comes off the left coronary cusp here. You'll notice that there's another coronary artery which comes off the left cusp right here. That's actually the LAD. And finally, you'll notice that the circumflex coronary artery, which is here, is actually arising posteriorly here off what we would normally call the non-coronary cusp. The non-coronary cusp, which points at the interatrial septum between the right atrium and the left atrium. Cardiac structure and function, if we have inadequate images from other non-invasive imaging modalities, then we can think about cardiac CT, looking at LV function, cardiac mass, or prosthetic valve dysfunction. Actually, cardiac CT is very good for looking at a prosthetic valve dysfunction if it's a mechanical valve where you're looking for a fracture in the strut or in the ring, either one. And those can actually be performed without contrast. RV function and RV morphology, such as ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or dysplasia, those really are going to be evaluated more by MRI. But if you have contraindications to MRI, then it is appropriate to go on to cardiac CT. As far as additional cardiac structure and function, pericardial anatomy, again, if you're looking for pericardial constriction, I think MRI is the better test. However, if you really need to look for calcification, cardiac CT does have an advantage there. Pulmonary vein anatomy, we use this extensively at our institution to map what the anatomy of the pulmonary veins are prior to pulmonary vein ablation for things such as atrial fib. You can see very nice images here. And also coronary vein mapping. Your cardiologist, especially your EP, may want to know what the coronary vein anatomy is if they're going to be placing a biventricular pacer and are having difficulty or are concerned about having difficulty in placing the left ventricular lead in a lateral left ventricular vein. Thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully this has answered your questions regarding what are the appropriate indications for cardiac CT.